Welcome to the Dear Doc Podcast, where we will discuss the business of running a dental practice with a panel of experts. Now, your host, Dr. Christopher Hoffpower. Hey guys, this is Doc Huffbauer coming to you again from my studio here in Alvin, Texas. And today I am lucky enough to be joined yet again by Paul Edwards from Cedar Human Resources Solutions. Now, Paul and Cedar are absolute experts in all things human resources, HIPAA, and also associate contracts because that goes along with the whole human resources side of things. Paul, now from what I understand, you actually have quite a few um, Dear Doc letters and posts that you'd like to talk about just on associate contracts. So I'd like to jump into that today, if you wouldn't mind. Are you you prepared to talk on that? Yeah, yeah. I've even made a few notes. So I got a few points and uh, try and, uh, you know, I I think we can provide some uh, good guidance for both sides because you've got both kind. you got, you have the owner doctor in and you have associates in and they're all asking questions. of of, of Absolutely. Well, it seems like in the most basic, basic of explanations, Everyone is simply trying to get the most for the least, or the yep. least for the most. And, you know, whatever, where we meet, meet in the middle is probably the best ground, but there's a lot of ancillary things around there um, that we really need to pay attention to. Things like, oh, you know, non-compete clauses and, you know, things like that. Yeah, so why don't absolutely. you go ahead and walk us through the basic anatomy, first of all, if you will, of an associate's agreement from the doctor side and from the associate side. And then we can talk individually about each and every clause and some of the things you see that are good and bad. Does that sound like a fair way to approach it? No, that sounds wonderful. Awesome. Well, go ahead and take it away, Paul. All right. So let's jump in at the very beginning. Um, If you want to create a win-win situation here, um, you just described it. If you get in that mentality of one of you is going to out-negotiate the other, I promise you that the working relationship is not going to last very long. Right. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, it, it, when I'm talking to doctors about interviewing associates, I frame this as kind of a marriage. Um, it's different than your regular relationship to an employee. You're working with a professional. Um, this person's going to be shoulder to shoulder with you. It's just a, it's a different type of relationship, even though they are ultimately going to be your employee. Well, I think in a lot of ways, Paul, what you're looking at is you're, um, you're looking at negotiating a marriage in, in a lot of ways. Well, you absolutely are. And that's the reason for the agreement. So we jump all the way to the end of the agreement. Um, handshakes are okay. But when relationships break up, whatever they are, um, the more you know how that relationship breakup is going to go, the better it is. So I guess it's a prenup of some sort, you know, of, of, of sorts. Um, but, but the important thing is, is that you get clear in the agreement. It is to settle all the upsets and to say that if this, if this, uh, not even if it goes south, if it just breaks up, but if it going south is the, uh, is the thing that happens, um, this is how we, this is how we're going to do it. And I've, and I've, sp- I've spoken to quite a few attorneys, um, in regards to associates contracts, mm-hmm. Paul, what you're saying rings so true. Inevitably they take a breath and they say, Doc, the real truth is we're negotiating the breakup. It's not the marriage. It's not the nuptials. It's what happens and who gets the kid in the house. Yep, absolutely. And then in between, unlike a prenup, we can pretty much predict and address all of the uh, conditions of employment that we need to address from beginning to end. And by the way, beginning to end could be many, many years. Um, and if you do this um, right, it really can be many years. I, I try to coach the doctor to say, when if your associate leaves you, it should be tough on both of you. They should be earning so well, fitting in so well, you should be so happy with what they're doing that both of you regret that they've got to go, um, that they've made this decision, that maybe they're, you know, the plan was we're going to you know, my first 10 years, I'm going to be an associate. And then our family plan was we're going to open our own practice and we're going to move back to my wife's uh, family's town. There's a practice there and off we go. Um, you, you just, you know, you, you just never know how this is going to go. But I, w- I love it when relationships last a long time. Right. A lot of work put in it to have it blow up in your face six months later for both, for both sides. Absolutely. 
So I start off by just saying, you know, I, I like to get clear about the reason for the associate. Why are you getting an associate? Because the reason why you're getting an associate can, can really um, should come into play on who you choose um, and what type of mindset that both of you are going to go into this relationship with together. So, you know, there's uh, health. You know, maybe your health's failing, and that's one reason you need to bring in an associate. I mean, you know, you right. know, there's plenty of bad backs out there and, and, and injuries and stuff that affect dentists, and, and you just need to back off on the hours. Maybe you just want to take more time off. You've put your first 12 uh, years in, you've worked your 80 hours a week, and you're thinking, you know, I might like to take a Friday afternoon off for real instead of sitting just in my office. Just every now and then. Just every now and then. I'd, I'd, I'd like to do that. Um, you know, patient demand. I mean, that's a, that's a great one. You, you're doing so well, you've got it figured out and you have enough patience that it just looks like this is where you want to go. Absolutely. Um, that's a know, great some, problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great problem to have and, and, and something we'll address a little bit here a little further. Um, you know, your mindset, you might be a growth mode kind of guy. So one of the things I love about working with dentists and it's very unique to dentists, quite unique to you, to everybody who's listening is you are both um, medical professionals and many of you are also true entrepreneurs. You, you go about the business of your practice differently than medical uh, doctors do. You, you just have a completely different mindset. So you might be in growth mode. You know, I've never been into my, uh, my, my you know, general practitioner for a health issue and him talk to me about how he's opening up two more practices and, you know, that, right. they're just not in that conversation. Um, and so maybe you're just a growth mode sort of guy and you want to do less dentistry or a, a you know, you want to do your 20 hours a week, but you know, you're going to have to run your, your, your multiple practices or maybe just your two practices. Um, you may want to free up some of your time that you're, uh, treating patients to do more lucrative cases because, you know, you found you're amazing at cosmetic dentistry Ooh. or. Or, you know, you like reconstructive dentistry and, and you're getting referrals in and, and you find you have a knack for it. And, and of course, you know, I mean, everybody's here to treat patients, but let's not, you know, set aside that income matters. And so, you know, you might want to bring in a, a, an associate to help you do some of the other cases that you don't want to be doing. But, you know, you have to be careful about that because nobody wants to come in and, and pick up the drags and that's all they're doing. Right. Just sit there and do your, you know, your passed off work all the time. So again, something that we coach on about, you know, bring someone in. It's okay to get them going in that area, but you need to sh tell the associate, you get to work on some of these cases too. Absolutely. It's gonna take time. Well, it's, you know, and Paul, just to, before, before you go on to the next point there, something I see so much is doctors who hire an associate, they bring them in and instead of giving them the bread and butter, and letting them really earn, they'll put them on hygiene checks. Yeah. And, oh. and, you know, class two fillings that they don't want to do. Right. Basically, you're creating a situation where you have someone who really could be a partner for you and a growth equity partner and yep. turning them into just a wage slave. And it, it's a horrible thing to see, but I see it again and again. These associates just fall out of this mill, you know, six months and they're gone. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, I ha I'm, I'm happy to say I, I probably coached, I don't know, Chris, that, so I started doing this in 2007 because I had a bunch of business experience um, before I started, you know, in, in kind of created Cedar. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've had a lot of doctors say to me, I don't want to be treated like I was treated when I was an associate. Right. Well, I do want to win win here, uh, but this has got to make sense for both of us. And so, you know, you, you just stated it. No, nobody wants to do just the crap work all the time. Well, so, absolutely. And there's a, there's a cost of opportunity there as well for yep. the owner doctor. And I think a lot of people don't realize this. I, I know what the statistics were whenever I worked in retail. I yep. don't actually know, and I'm ashamed to say that I don't know what the cost is in dental, but I imagine it's even greater. In retail, it was a $10,000 cost to onboard a new employee simply in lost wages and inefficiencies. Oh, yeah. And so I can only imagine that in dentistry, onboarding not even just an assistant or a hygienist, but a doctor, a provider, that's yeah. got to come with a huge cost of opportunity. It really does. And you have to set a structure up around it that ensures their success. And that structure, not all associates love when they're told what that structure might look like. Okay. Um, 
you know, in the most successful offices, and I'm, I'm just, I'm sharing with you. I mean, it, it, not all of this comes out of my head. I'm, more, I'm, I'm out there with some of the best coaches, and they're coaching their, their disciples, their dentists on what to do. And I'm taking in all of that. And there's a variety of different approaches. Um, you know, when you, when you're, when you're bringing someone in, the team that supports them is just as important as the associate that you're bringing in. And so it's kind of hard to, for an associate to be told, you know, actually your close in day-to-day manager is going to be our practice administrator. She's the one who can ensure your success. And here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to take my dental assistant who is amazing and she's going to work with you for the first three months and then you can't have her anymore. She's the example of what you want. I get her back. I'm going to be training yours um, while she's with me or he's with me. And I love that idea. And then you're going to flip and then you're going to make them yours because there'll be, there'll be ways and you know, things you want to do. The most important thing is, is we have a system here. And if you work in our system and allow us to support you, and sometimes that is going to feel like we're directing you, um, then you're going to be incredibly successful here. If what you want is to come in and be on your own and do your own thing, and you don't want to work inside of a system, then you should let me know now because I am assistant oriented dentist. Right. That's super important because here's the thing. Let's talk numbers real quick. Before you bring somebody in, you should be having at least 45 new patients per month. Like that's happening. You've figured it out. And and, and that's what's going on. When you think about what's going on and you look at the numbers, you see that you probably can quickly approach 65 to 70 to 80 new patients. If you simply had the slots in the schedule. You have the slots. You've got the hygiene you know, the build it and they will come thing, right. you know, you've, 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 uh, you've built out two more operatories or three or whatever, you know, you needed. Um, your team is there. You, your team, you, you know, your team's never perfect, but your team is there. Your core members of your team are there. Now you can bring an associate in and you can plug them in and you're in a much better position to negotiate with the associate and the mm-hmm. associates in a better position to negotiate with you because you can give them an offer based off of reality. It's right. not like we're going to grow the practice together. It's like we've grown it, we are growing it, and now you're going to come in and help us complete um, this part of our mission. And in return for that, we expect you to do $800,000 of, of dentistry in, in the first year. Um, if not in the first year, by the, by the middle of the year, we need to see that you're on track to do that. And, um, and we don't base that $800,000 number off of, of thin air. I pulled that out of thin air because I'm talking to you right now. But if my host, Dennis, is doing 1.2 to 1.3, he or she knows that they're going to have to give up a little bit of what they're doing in order to feed this associate. Um, But they're also looking for the next million dollars. They're they're looking out ahead and saying that those patients are out there um, and that somebody's got to do that dentistry and it's going to be the associate. So, I've heard I've heard of an average around sixty percent for a for a good associate. Mm-hmm. You can expect the associate to produce sixty percent of what the owner produces in their first year. Is that about right? I I I tell my owners that they should be shooting for eighty mm-hmm. percent, and if they're down at sixty percent, something's wrong. Um, okay. and it could be the staff. I I have to tell you, we get this a lot because the staff is shooting the associate in the foot because they're like, no, 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 that's a new guy. You want you want to be at the you want, yeah, you want the doctor. Oh, you have, you know, you have this, you want, you want doctor, you want Dr. H, you want Dr. A. And right. you have to train them. Don't do that. You know, um, there's a time and a place to say, oh, of course you can have them. A lot of um, that comes with building your team members though, including yep. the new associate. If you're constantly saying, oh shit, I can't believe they did that. Mm-hmm. By the way, once again, this is why we have an explicit language warning on the podcast. Yeah. Because so, I have a potty mouth. So if, if you're constantly saying that to your employees, you are building a culture where they don't trust your new associate. And that yeah. associate will never be successful in your practice. No, and you see those complaints across all kinds of listservs where associates are complaining about not being respected by the team. Right. That, I'm just telling you, doctors out there that own your practices, that's you. That's on you. You, you have to set the example there. And it's an intentional thing. Well, Paul, you've obviously, you've obviously been through a few of these. I'm going to ask you to think about, 
because I'm going to let you get back to finishing this, this okay. little spiel we're on here. But I'm going to ask you to think about your top three, four, maybe even five tips for how you can make the right culture to help an associate to grow and how you can coach that associate to increase their production and to get their dentistry in lines with the quality and quantity that you believe is, is necessary. And you're going to spend, if it's a new associate, you're going to spend your first year trying to, right. trying to get that right. Um, Absolutely. For sure. So write uh, that down and we'll, we'll jump back on that maybe at the end of this episode or maybe in another episode. Just okay, to, no, I would love it. I would love to just have a culture talk about a practice that's growing. That's got not, you know, it's not just you and your seven, seven team members. It's, it's, you know, you're growing, you're growing out. Um, I'd love to. So other things that you want to think about when you're bringing in an associate, you just want to have these things in mind. And again, everything that I'm addressing here um, um, is, 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 should be addressed inside the associate agreement. So, and notice I'm calling it an agreement and I, and I'm doing it quite intentionally. It is a contract, but we refer to it as an agreement because it's an at will agreement. Right. This means that the associate could walk in and quit and walk away any, at any point And you could tell them you've had enough of them just like you could with any other employee. Now, hackles go up. I mean, people were like, oh, no, that's not what I want. I want to contract with them if I'm going to put all this work into them and I'm going to, and I'm going to invest in them and I'm going to bring them in. I want them to stay for X number of days. I want them to stay for a year and renew the contract and do all these things. And I'm just telling you, I've seen that model go really, really bad because, A, you never want to keep somebody in an agreement that they don't want to be in no. or in a position they don't want to be in. Or in your office treating your patients, at least they're yours right now. I have seen an associate more than once, a couple times, make the life of the host doctor a living hell over that contract because she was trying to get fired. And she needed to get fired. She was not happy. She made a bad choice. They, he made a bad choice. They chose wrong together. And then they, and then they bound themselves. And, and so um, just, I just wanted to make that kind of side point there. It isn't that you can't do that, that there aren't some instances where it makes sense. But I'm going to say 99% of the time, you need an open-ended uh, employment agreement and not a... Uh, and not a contract that has a, a, a certain amount of time. Paul, to that, to that point, and, and this is something I find that um, as dentists, we have to be great communicators. And we have to be able to mm -hmm. reflect and, and get a relationship going within minutes with a total stranger. Mm -hmm. And I find that in the practice of business in dentistry, we tend to be very poor communicators. Um, you know, I, I, I have a few friends who've talked to me about their associateships and they're telling, oh, the owner dentist did this and this and this and this. And I said, so how did the conversation go whenever you talk to him? Talk to him. Talk to him. I can't talk to him. Yeah. So in, in these conversations, a lot of times, even if you're under a, a contract where it's not an at will type thing, if you simply talk to your boss and said, look, man, this isn't working out and I'm not happy and I want your practice to do as well as possible. I need to not be here. Can we go ahead and write something up that says we can get out of this early? Yep. I'd let you go <laughs> because I don't want you working on my patients and making my team sour and destroying the culture I'm trying to build. If you're not the right fit, I would let you out of that. And I can only think that most people are like that, that they would. It feels like security, but it's not. When you do that term contract, it feels like security, but it, but it really is not in the end. Uh, people, people need to choose to be where they are all the time. Uh, that's why there aren't contracts for marriage. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, we're getting married and I'm going to say we're going to be together for seven years. And then this thing's right. going to auto renew at the end of that. You know, it, it just, doesn't, that's, it just doesn't work. Well, you know, shackles and security both start with an S. Yes. It's, Oh, I love that. That's awesome. No, you can I, I have that, that one, brother. <laughs> Hang on a second. I'm going to make a note. Um, <laughs> Okay, so some of, some of the other things that uh, uh, doctors out there want to think about, and, so I'm, and some of these I'm talking to doctors maybe for the first time you're getting an associate. For others, um, you know, some of this will make sense, some of it you already know. Um, you, know you want to think about um, liability. So you're bringing in another associate. I know everyone's thinking, well, liability, that's what we have insurance for. But I'm telling you, liability with your employees. 
So I have uh, as many calls about associates doing bad things with employees and satellite offices as I have of any other call that comes in. And so, you know, because they're an employee, um, it's very, very important that they are subject to your employee handbook. Now, a well-written associate agreement will say uh, that where the associate agreement and the handbook differ, that the associate agreement controls. So an associate may negotiate for more time off or may not be eligible for paid time off where the employees are, that sort of thing. So you want to you wanna address that stuff. Um, but you do have liability there and you need to take it into account. You know, putting multiple associates in place and not having really good strong HR and a good handbook and a way for your employees right. to report, you know, that there's a problem with this associate. <clears throat> You, they, they all go hand in hand, which you explained at the beginning. And, and Paul, real quick there, and mm -hmm. I, I'm getting you all off your flow here. I know you okay, have a, a... I don't mind. Here's the deal, guys. And Paul is not here to, um, to ring his own bell and tell you to go with Cedar. But I'm going to tell you that what is required in a contract for employees, you know, so far as paid time off and sick leave and maternity leave, that's going to vary by state. And you can't just go on and talk to Dr. Facebook, even if it's me, and get the right answers all the time. You need an expert and you need an expert in the state you're in. So when you're making these contracts, please consider getting an expert. If it's Paul, if it's, um, goodness, um, Dr. Gerlach, whoever it is you're talking to, Make sure they're an expert in your state. Sorry about yeah, that. You, I thought yeah, that was absolutely. an important point to bring up. Yep, absolutely. Make sure. Because here's the thing: an attorney can an attorney can put together uh, an agreement, and an attorney can understand um, what you tell him about your practice. What you tell him about your practice. But how much can you really tell someone else about your practice? They need to understand the DNA of how a practice works and the challenges that come up. And so Absolutely. You, you, you just got to be, you just got to be careful. You want a really good expert. You know, you know, Chris, I'm not an attorney. I have seven of them working for me. I am an expert in HR. I'm an expert in, in, in contracts. Um, but you know, all of this stuff still has to be buttoned up by those legal minds that understand what's going on in each jurisdiction. Right. And, you know, so, so, you know, if you can get the best of both worlds, the business mind and the, uh, and the, and the legal mind to put it together, that's, that's what you're looking for. But it's kind of the what and the how. Here's what we need to happen. Now, you guys make it legal. Look, if they haven't done 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, then they're not your guy or your gal. You need somebody who has that experience. Don't let them experiment on you. Absolutely. Uh, so, get, so, other things to think. So, we talked a little bit about liability. Um, extra team. So you're going to have to hire more people. Um, you're also going to lose some of your time to managing. You, you've already learned this, but as soon as you put an associate in, you're going to have to manage certain aspects of that, of that associate's relationship to the practice. Um, here's, a, he, um, you, you know, here's a nugget for you guys. It's something you're going to want to make sure that gets done. In our agreement, we ask the associate to review their, their treatment what their production for the week every the following week so sometime on monday or tuesday set aside an hour to look at the production that you just did last week and confirm that everything is correct that's that, brilliant for so many reasons paul oh we've coded we've coded things right but what 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 i'm doing for you host doctor is is it's really hard to come back as an associate and and get in a tussle with you and quit and claim that you were not paying me right. right. When I have been reviewing the records every single, every single month and all of my doctors report, I mean, not all, because they don't all report back to me. More than a few have reported back, Paul, that one thing got the practice an extra $45,000 of income. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so I started doing it. That's, that's what the doctors, that's what the host doctors mm -hmm. say. I started going through mine and it's just a process that we go through. There's also a phenomenon that um, you'll hear a lot from different consultants, which by the way, I'd love a list of the best consultants you work with. Obviously I can't ask you that on the air because okay. we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But um, one of the, the big phenomenon there that, that's, that's right in your face, aside from just making sure you're auditing things to make sure they're done correctly, that which is measured grows, people. 
Yep. If your associate is looking at their production and they're seeing what they did, they're going to instinctively, it is ingrained in us, they're going to try to beat that number on the next go round. And it's going to constantly be in the back of their minds, whether they realize it um, consciously or not, it's going to be there. Yeah, they get in a competition with themselves. And what you pay attention to. That's a healthy competition. Yeah, what you, what you measure, you pay attention to. And what you pay attention to, you can make changes around. And by yeah. the way, you're doing this with the team. And so the team is, or is, it should be egging that associate on, and they should be able to feel pride that that associate did a little bit better this month than they did last month because we kept him or her moving. And right. we, we got him a couple of really big cases this month that went really well that we couldn't get him last month, but we got him to him this month. So that, that opens the door to a lot of conversations about um, team culture and how you grow a culture within the practice around your new associate. And that's, a, that's an entire podcast by itself. Oh, yeah. You could rally your entire team for a year around an associate. And you wouldn't believe the, the other things that would happen inside of your practice. Yeah, for you absolutely. as the owner, think you would be, you you would be amazed what happens when you put a well cultured team together that has a mission. They've got something to do. Everybody's always asking, you know, how do I reward my team and how do I do this? How do I do that? Give them something to do that they're passionate about, and tell them where they fit. And when they get it right, cheerlead. Put on your little outfit. Gentlemen, put on your little cheerleading outfit, get your pom poms out, run out the room, and congratulate your team. You're, a they, you know, when you're when you become a leader like this, you get you, you end up doing a lot of cheerleading. Um, so yes. associates have to be managed. There's a cost to acquire the associate. It, there just is. You got to spend a lot of time doing this. They're not always easy to find. I mean, I got guys out in. You know, I love that I learned this. I got guys out in rural areas, Arkansas, Montana. Um, uh, Wyoming and you know we finally figured out that the ad starts with do you love fishing and hunting and and then we go from there um, so you know it's not always easy to find somebody to spend a lot of time doing it uh, right and then you know there's the cost about of turnover you know when you make the wrong choice and you know you got to get the associate out or they know they got to go um, there's, there's do, you, there. do you recommend you know I have I have several different friends who they use different types of um, of social metrics is what I like to call them. Personality tests and inclination yep. tests and things like that. The Colby, the yep. dip. Uh, what do you recommend whenever it comes to a professional? Because I would, I would think that, um, and perhaps it's arrogant of me to assume, but I would think that a professional, you need really more of an in-depth investigation about who they are rather than a chairside assistant because they're so much more complex as people in general. Or is that just arrogance? That might be arrogance, but I don't know that it's arrogance. I think that it, it it's, I, I think it's true to a degree, but it's true because you're going to be working so close with this person. Right. Nobody else in your business is going to be taking thirty percent of the of of the income. And right. So what you should have is a high expectation of that person, and to have confirmed that they meet that high expectation, they will do what they're going to do. They're going to be who they're going to be. You're going to lead and set examples of where you're going to lead, but you, they have to have those tools in the first place. And you're, you know, you're absolutely correct. If they're not at that level and not everybody is yet, you know, a lot of guys, I think you might tell me, I mean, I have a lot of associate doctors say, I don't, I, I don't want to admit how stupid I was those first two or three years. I don't want to admit what I would go home and tell my wife about how I felt about that practice or about that dentist. And I didn't have a clue what was going on on the profit. You're not, to, you're not taught to succeed in dental school. You simply aren't. Anyone, guys, if you are a young dentist and you're just graduating, um, if you are three or four years out and you don't own your own practice yet, I'll tell you from experience, and I think Paul can back me up on this, your entire philosophy may well change within the first four years. You are certainly going to see things differently, and you will certainly realize that there are many things, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some numbers up here. 90% of what you learn in dental school should be challenged. 10% is dead wrong. I think it's true about everything. Even if you go into business school and come out with your MBA. Um, it, it's a it, good point. It's a good it, point. School, school, is, school is to put you in a mindset. 
And obviously you guys are learning skills, you know, you know, literally thumbs wet, hands on. Um, but there's a lot to be learned when you come out of it. And if you want to be a business owner, the amount to learn on top of the, the clinical skills is just it never stops. If you're not, if you are not up to learn something new for the rest of your life, every third day about business, then you should stay an associate, find a great, find a great doctor, go to work for him or her and, and, and earn and just, and just earn. I, I hate to say this and I hate this saying because I don't think it's necessarily true. Those who can do and those who can't teach. I, I don't believe that's entirely true. I believe right. there's great people who really know what they're talking about. Yeah. But I will say this, find someone who has and ask is kind of my little aphorism whenever it comes to that. If you want to be successful in business, find someone who has and ask. Find someone who's done what you want to do. Oh, yeah. Whether it be, you know, playing drums. Oh, whatever. Chris. Of you, I told you I was going to pick on you about drums. For those of you listening, if you're listening to I'm giving podcast, double thumbs down. He's his, yeah, he's giving me the double thumbs down. He's a guitarist. I just want everyone to know. He's a, he's a guitarist. He's got guitars hanging behind I, Hey, we've covered this. The guitar is a percussion instrument. Yeah, well, if I bang on it or slam it against the wall. but uh, Hey, Kurt, you know, Kiss, Kiss certainly thought it was a percussion instrument. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Sure. But anyway, sorry, sorry for getting completely off, uh, off the thread there. But folks, really, if you want to do anything in life, find someone who's been successful at it and simply ask them. In general, they will be very giving because they're successful, because they're passionate, and passion lends itself toward tutelage. Oh, I love to tell people something that they don't know that I know. I mean, there's nothing that makes me happier than to be absolutely uh, instructed. I mean, that's why we're on this podcast together. I get to share the knowledge of 13 years of doing associate degree. Absolutely. With hundreds and hundreds of doctors who every single one of them, almost all of them brought some new nuance or idea to the, to the agreement, just like they do to our handbook. And, and, it, and it literally has changed over time. Chris, I have, we, I we have, have time. No, we do have time. We're actually going to do a long format this time. Okay, uh, okay, so good. we're at 35 minutes. We're going to go to an hour on this one. Okay. So real quick though, there's mm -hmm. another one of my little sayings and I, I think you'll actually like it. Yeah. I told you my, I teach my team with aphorisms. I tell them a story and then I give them a moral at the end. And I say, uh -huh. if you just remember this, you'll remember the lessons that we learned. And one of those lessons is nobody is worthless. They can always serve as a great, bad example. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It really is. I, I, you know, and I think I, I, I hate to admit it, but I think if you look at yourself every day, you probably fill that role at some point. Absolutely. Yourself. Exactly. You know, over the phone with somebody you're frustrated with or, or with, you know, it, it's your, your significant other or in traffic or, you know, for me, it's standing in line at a grocery store. I, I have my own, my own demons around what goes on in front of me. Uh, it's true. It's true. You really can be a really good, bad example if you're not careful. Um, Absolutely. The difference is, is you're learning from it. You, you, you can laugh at yourself and, and check it, you know, every now and then. One hopes. If you can be introspective, yep. the sky's the limit. Yep. It is. It is. So, so Chris, the other thing I, I, I saw a lot of posts about was about percentage. Like, you know, what yes. should I pay my associate? Um, well, it depends on what you're making in your practice, doesn't well, it? It depends on your overhead. and It does. It does. And so I've asked um, every single person I've ever coached, what, what is your profit and loss? And I have to tell you, eight out of 10 dentists, just like on television, don't know exactly what their profit and loss is for the last year. And so they've got an idea. Oftentimes they're way off. So I send them off with some homework and say, well, you know, because they'll say, look, I've got one associate, she wants 34%. I got this other associate, she wants 29%. And then I got these two guys, one of them's fresh out of dental school, he's asking for 47%. And, and then, uh, and then I've got another guy who is coming out of retirement, and he's asking for 38%. I, I don't um, know about you, my first question would be, can they show me what the track record of production is in their previous practice? Oh, absolutely. So there's this thing that you, that you go down, but the first thing I want everyone out there to understand is their profit and loss, their own profit and loss. And so they'll come back to me and they'll say, okay, I check with the accountant and I'm at 72% uh, 
uh, loss. I'm, 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 overhead. Making, I'm, I'm, yep, 72% overhead. And I'll go. And that's more common than people think. I, I, well, I've seen 115, 120% overhead. Oh, I've seen people way, way, way higher and I've seen guys way lower. So the next question I ask is, how did you factor in your own pay to that? And the doctor will be like, well, you know, we pay me $100,000, but, you know, we're producing $1.2 million. We, you know, the CPA doesn't have me put it all in there. And I send them back to the, send them back to the math and say, no, multiply yours times 30% and put that figure in there. And then they come back and say, oh, crap, I'm <laughs> underpaced. I'm at 82% overhead mm -hmm. or I'm at 91% overhead um, if I do that. So that's the number we need because if we bring an associate in and we put them in a satellite office and we pay them 30% and you, and you create, recreate the magic you're creating, right. you're going to have 9% to work with. Is it worth 9% to pay the rent, the lease, and take on all those employees and put that associate doctor in that, in that other space? And there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into this, um, this discussion right here, Paul. And I think some of it may even be completely out of, um, out of the scope of our discussion, but I'm going to bring it up anyway, if, if that's cool. Okay. Um, so folks, and, and this is, this is not for me. This is for people who are way, way smarter than I am. Whenever you're looking at what your percentages are, there's lots of ways that you can change your overhead. The one that almost everyone seems to fixate on is reducing costs. Yep. Or they fixate on increasing production, produce your way out of it. But one of the things that they simply don't think about is that your lab bill rises and your materials expendables bill rise in direct proportion to the amount of dentistry that you're doing. And so it really has to be a multifactorial approach to reducing your overhead you can't simply latch onto one number. Um, a dental Intel has an, an absolutely amazing way of, of describing it. And they're talking about levers and switches. Levers make big changes and switches make small changes. And um, I'll, I'll actually share the, um, share the formula that they use in a different, different episode. Uh, I'll see if I can actually get the uh, CEO of uh, dental Intel on and have a talk about efficiencies, but folks, it, it's not just one thing. It's everything. And although that might sound overly complex, it's the truth. And it's ever changing. So, you know, we talked yes. earlier, I, I told you, you're going to have to factor in that you've got to add in advertising. You're going to have to add in some more help. You're going to have to uh, decrease your production a little bit as you do more management. You may have to add other layers. Um, uh, other, other expenses all the way across the board. And you may look at those numbers in the first six months of this associate. You right. may actually be losing money on this associate. I'll, not, I'll, not that they're not doing a great job. It's just, you know, as you ramp up, it costs more. Well, and, and one of the things that I, I would suggest, and Paul, you can tell me I'm, I'm a complete idiot and that's okay. Cause we, we have that. Them. I bet <laughs> you can't, you drummer, you No, but uh, <laughs> seriously though, uh, one of the things that I look at um, and whenever I'm talking to someone about this is that you really need to look at your, your downgrades and your write-offs in your insurance as an advertising expense. And whenever you're factoring in the cost of, um, of first of all, cost of doing business, but also when you're factoring in the cost of bringing new patients to that prospective associate, because what a lot of doctors will do is they'll say, I'm going to bring an associate in and I'm going to put them on every insurance under the sun. Yeah. And then they're going to act as a pipe that funnels bigger cases to me. But when you're doing that in reality, you're inflating your advertising costs for that associate and the cost of acquisition of a patient greatly above what you would be doing if you simply advertised for that new doctor. Right. Paul, what are your thoughts on that? No, I think you're exactly right. You, every, everything that you do is a lift and it's going to have an associated cost. Absolutely. The, you just have to make sure the cost is the smallest you can get for the benefit. Exactly. And uh, what I think a lot of people don't realize this, I like to use grocery stores as an example. Grocery stores profit, and, and you're going to be stunned by this, everybody, is they run 2 to 6%. That's what they right. run. So you think they're making a bunch of money, but they're not. But they do multiple millions of dollars, and so that adds up to millions Absolutely. and billions of dollars of income. 
that you want it. You don't. You know. You don't want to be at six percent. You would like to be at eighteen percent. Right. That's accomplished intentionally. Um, and, and you just got to figure out how to categorize all these things so you can think about them. And it goes back to that: what you pay attention to and measure, uh, you can you can make adjustments to. Well, you know, um, the the CEO of McDonald's famously asked at a, a convention. He said, "What business are we in?" And everyone shouted out, "Hamburgers, yeah. restaurant business." And he said, "No, we're in the real estate business." Right. And the reason is, is that McDonald's business model is to take a penny from every dollar, but to have a whole lot of dollars. So you need the real estate dollars. where yep. people are going to be trafficking in because you need a lot of clientele. Right. And so that, that's kind of the same thing we're talking about here. Yeah, it, it, is, um, it is the other side of the coin. You know, it is, it is the other side of this factor. So when you're thinking about compensation with associates, so I saw a lot of things out there. I saw even some people talking about 18 to 22 percent is it was what they saw. For those people who were posting that or seeing that, I, I'm aware of that percentage, but that percentage is in a different model than a straight up net production model. So, um, well, actually, well, let's take a step back there. Let's talk about different forms of compensation, and then we can talk about. Um, Putting aside the argument of what is your overhead? Yep. Yeah. Ranges of numbers. Would that be fair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we've got adjusted production. We've got production. We've got net production. We've got uh -huh. collections. List them all out for us and talk to us about where we are. Well, look, here's the one that I'd like for everybody to use. I'd like for you to use net production. And, and in the agreement, we're going to say these are what the write downs are for. And right at the top is going to be whatever the insurance company takes away. So that, that goes away. Um, and then we'll, depending on the type of dentistry that's being done, you know, if there's a lot of restorative dentistry, you know, a lot of implants we're going to put in there that all the, all the burrs, you know, you guys go, can go through hundreds of dollars of those things in a case. So we're going to address that sort of stuff. Basically what we're saying is, is what you guys all think of as the collection model which is the, for every dollar that you produce that I actually get, I'm going to give you a percentage of it. That's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. The problem can be when you use language um, and an agreement that says that I'm going to pay you based on collections, you, that, is a, that is a function of accounting. And you may be opening yourself up for an associate to argue that you were not doing your job collecting their money properly. And mm -hmm. therefore, as part of this breakup argument, they want an accounting of everything that they did and everything that was collected for the Nobody for the last is an week. audit. <laughs> yeah. So, so you want to be careful. And that's why we use the term net production and we get down into the nitty gritty of what we're going to reduce for. And at the end of it, we say, and we can reduce for other things, and we'll let you know what those are when we do that. So now we're paying the associate based off of what the, uh, the, the uh, practice actually receives. And in this day and age, I don't know very many practices that do an in-house financing plan. You all use, you know, an, you know care credit or someone like that. Um, I, I haven't run into anybody in a long time that's actually said well, we have our own in-house financing there, plan. There are. Um, and, and there are all, there are also various methods that people use to accomplish that. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to actually give a shout out to a few people. Drew Burns has a company that, um, sets up software that allows dentists to do in-house financing and charge interest, uh, completely legally because they go state by state. Mm -hmm. Passion Finance does the same thing and uh, they're fantastic. Bruce Baird, um, so there are ways that people do this. In fact, um, Zach Almond uh, and his company, Apex uh, Solutions, uh, they are Apex Payment Solutions, rather. They actually have a terminal where you can register a monthly amount that comes off of a patient's credit card. And because right. it's a credit card, even if they cancel that credit card, they still continue to be billed. Or if they cut up that credit card and get another they continue to be billed, which is actually kind of a beautiful thing. You can't do that with debit cards. Right. So there are practices that still do that. And it's actually, believe it or not, Paul, on the rise. Um, right. I think that's, it's, it's a direct response to the increasing management fees yep. for these loan companies. 
Yep. No, absolutely. So I would say to that, um, the, the, the mindset that we put our uh, owner doctors in on our compensation stuff is that you pay them based off of what you think you're going to collect for them. We put a mechanism in there for you to make adjustments. So, um, you know, if you're, if yeah, you, if, there's, you know, there's nothing worse than whenever someone pays the 20% down and then vanishes with the dentist. Yeah. No, no, exactly. Exactly. And, and what if you give someone a payment plan and your associate is in that, like it's, it's, um, you know, it's ortho or something like that. We put in the agreement that they get paid as you get paid. So if they're doing a $5,000 case and the, and the, and, and the patient pays the $5,000 up front, we don't give it all to the associate. It gets broken in increments right. until all the treatment's done. And here's another thing that no one thinks about in the agreement. What happens if in the treatment plan, they need two more visits at the end? They just need two more quick visits. And everybody knows we're not going to charge the patient for that, right? We're not. It's, they've already paid their five grand. They, we just need them in the chair for 15 minutes, two more times over the next month and a right. half. Everything's going to be great. We're not going to charge them for it. We're not going to charge their insurance. We're not going to do any of that. We're also not going to pay the associate for that either. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the associate needs to know. They need to know at the outset that that's the kind of, you know. Absolutely. And it's simply professionalism, but I think that sometimes our, our grasp on what professionalism is is tenuous at best whenever there's money involved. Yep. So People get weird. They do. So one yeah. of the things I want to talk about here in this particular area of our discussion mm -hmm. is what is just and right for an associate to be paid on and, and what is – just silliness. Like I see on the, on the threads all the time and guys, please don't get mad at me. If you've done this, I'm not making fun of you. I just, I'm trying to make you think. I see people all the time saying, well, I want to get paid for the bite wings and the PAs because if I didn't read them, then guys, that's not production. That's opportunity. Yep. That's yep, the opportunity it is. For treatment. It now is. on the other side of things, Paul, and I've seen this too, the owner doc makes me see all of his Invisalign clean checks. Right. And that's just not right, people. Right. Unless you've attached a price to each of those and the associate is getting paid on them. And still, not only is it not right, it's not smart because that associate could be making you money. Just my two cents. No, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I, it, you, it's got to be... It, it's got to be a win-win, and you know, if we're running, uh, if we're running a big, I don't know, if we're running a big promotion and we're doing free exams and X-rays, then everybody knows why we're doing that. We're trying to get to the dentistry on the other side of it, and so if that's something that we do in our practice, we need our associate to know that that's going to happen, and that nobody's getting paid for this. I'm not getting paid. You're not getting paid. But if you see a patient. And you, and they've got a problem and we diagnose it and they go, yes, let here's my insurance card or here's my, here's my checkbook. That's your patient. And by the way, if they bring in their four kids and their husband and they, and that's, they start referring, that's all yours too. I, this is how we have things. Owner docs, please, please, please listen to this because if you want to have an associate who stays with you and Paul, do you have any statistics on the increase in production over time for an associate? Well, what we say to the doctor is that the associate, if the associate's not making 80%, not producing 80% of what you produce, you, you don't have something right, and it's not right. going to work out for either one of you because you're going to not get that. Remember that, that? Not specifically that, that number. I'm, I'm talking okay. about if you have an associate that you keep happy. You see, I, I don't know what the actual statistic is. I'll tell you my feeling. Okay. And what I think I hear a lot of is that most associates only last for six months in their first job. And that, that's what I hear time and time again. Yep. And so if you have an associate who lasts for six months, you have barely begun to finish training them in the basics at that yep. point. So at a year, how much more productive are they than at that six month period? And at 18 months and at 24 months, how much more productive are they now that they've hit their flow and they understand their assistance, they understand your systems and protocols, my contention is that if you find a way to not screw your young associate and they stay on for a year, 
you're going to be making more money in that second six months than you did in the first six months. And so if you're continuing to repeat that, re that cycle where you're hiring a new doctor every six months, all you're doing is you're getting the low production. It's not a smart business model for your practice. No, it's not. And you're right. It, 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 it's, the answer to your question is, is it's just like the people who are listening to this who are our host doctors. You know how much better you've gotten. You, you, know, Absolutely. you know that you came out of dental school and you were taught to do something that took you an hour and 45 minutes that you can do in 18 minutes on a bad day now. Yes. And you know that you can teach that to someone else and that they can repeat it, but it's going to take a while because when you came out of dental school and the first dentist who looked at you and said, where have you been for the last hour and a half? And you tell him and he says, well, I do that in 30 minutes. You didn't believe him. You know, you, so it's they're on the same track you are. They're just not there yet. So guys, I, I hope for those of you who know me, I'm pretty clinically adept, but I want to share a story of my first practice, um, first practice I worked in, uh, unfortunately, he's passed away, Dr. Glenn Garrison, one of the greatest men I ever knew, brilliant, kind, and, and a, an amazing mentor. Good mentor, yeah. I, I wish that more people had that experience. Um, so I got out of my first, very first patient out of dental school. I still remember the old man, and he had three missing teeth. And after my hour and a half explanation of what we could do to fix the three <laughs> missing teeth, Glenn, Glenn walked up and said, Chris, come on in the office. I want to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> Put his arm around and he said, what the hell were you talking to that guy for so long for? And I right. said, well, well, Dr. Garrison, I had to tell him about, you know, whether or not we could do a removal partial. And I had to explain to him whether or not we had a, a metal base or if we're going to do an acrylic and what types of class we would use and whether or not they would cause forces on the other teeth. And, and he stops and says, son, 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 stop, stop. Those people came in here for teeth. Just give them some teeth. Right. Some of the, some of the best wisdom I've ever heard from anyone in my career in dentistry, patients come to you for teeth, give them teeth. Right. So anyway, I'm sorry, but I thought that was, it, it, it was exactly what you're talking about here. Where were you for an hour and a half? I was doing a class two filling. <laughs> Look, it takes you back to, it's a privilege to work for another doctor who is a good mentor. And that's something else that it I do in the early coaching is I ask the doctor, are you a mentor or not? Because if you're not a mentor, then the, 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 the dentist, he or she who gets out of dental school is not your associate. Let's filter those They're people employed. out. If you don't have the patience for this or the desire or this, you know, based on the conditions, you, you can't be a mentor and bring this person along, then right. you would, neither would be doing a disservice. But if you're out there, here's, here's the thing. If you want to open a restaurant, what you need to do is go work at a restaurant. And it would be good if you worked at one that's run really poorly and one that's run really, really well. Yes. And you do your job and you pay attention to everything that's going on. And if someone says to you, I'm going to make you a manager. You're going to get to see the books and you're going to get to do X, Y, and Z and learn more about why this place is failing or why it's successful. That is a privilege. That is a lesson that you as a, as a, as a business owner or a future business owner need to be getting your hands on. And you will make so fewer mistakes if someone else will let you watch their mistakes Absolutely. Never mind the or even just tell you. And if you're the yeah. kind of person who can't learn from other people's mistakes, yeah. you're screwed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, Paul, it, it makes me smile because my very first job was actually, my kids hate it because I have a story for everything. Yeah. But my very Dude. first job, I, I kind of figured, Paul, yeah. so they're all about drums though. Yeah. So uh, my, first, uh, my first job was actually at this place called the Hub City Diner. It was a, a 1960 place. Um, with, uh, you know, the, the purple people eater playing on the jukebox in the background and stainless steel and chrome everything, right? And I remember I was the lowliest position there was to start off with. I was the bus boy. And so I'm just, man, I was always taught if you're ever going to do anything in life, you, you do it to your best. If you're going to be a ditch digger, be the best damn ditch digger there is. And so I worked my ass off at that place and I would bust the tables as fast as I could, get them clean, reset them, make sure they had napkins, make sure the salt and pepper shakers. And, you know, I'd switch out the, 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 uh, the ketchup bottle and everything else. And 
it was kind of cool because the waitresses would always come up to me at the end of the shift and give me a hug and they give me some of their money that they made from tips. Yeah. Because I was pushing people through their tables faster than any of us would. Yep. And it's just, because I didn't do it for the money. I just did because I thought that's what we were supposed to do. We're supposed to, <laughs> you know, clear the tables. That's what the job description was. But it, it talks to you a lot about that teamwork that is in a restaurant that we'd like to see in our practices. So let me point this out, Chris. Someone taught those waitresses to tip you out. Yes. So we'll talk about culture. And yes. because of that, you just told that story. And had that culture and that team not been what it was, you wouldn't have this story. You're absolutely right. And, you know, the thing is, I'm the firm belief that uh, we're kind of like balls of twine. That string that winds and winds around itself, every single string interacts with another part of string. And those are all the stories our lives are composed of. And that's what we're made of, the way that our stories interact. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I started off, I started off my first business as a nightclub owner and managing bands for 14 years. And when I talk to those people in that other life, when I was 30 years old, who knew me then, and I tell them what I'm doing now, they're like, what? Wait, wait, how did you go from working with? Them? I still have the long hair, man. It's okay. Exactly. I got a, little bit, I got a little bit of the hair going on <laughs> and lots of denial, but I will never grow up. Um, but Nonetheless, I'm, I'm that ball of twine. I'm all those experiences um, are associate agreements, bringing it back around all of those doctors that we've worked with and those upsets that we've seen where we've been like, we could have cured that if we had addressed that in the associate agreement. Um, Absolutely. All of those people that I ever worked for, I, I, Chris, I made so many mistakes. Um, I well, think you know, I, you know who doesn't make mistakes? Yeah. People that aren't up to anything. That's right. Yeah. All right, my friend. Look, we've taken an hour of these good people's time, and you have shed some wisdom that I hope they're picking up on. Folks, thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time listening to me babble on and, and listening to Paul drop some wisdom on you folks. Paul, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And so that you know, uh, I always have to do disclosures. Paul was not paying me. Drew Burns did not pay me. I uh, compassion finance did not pay me. Whoever else I mentioned in this podcast did not pay me, but Hey folks, if you want to send me a check, you can anyway, have a great day. And thank you for joining us again. Thanks for listening to the dear doc podcast, your source for the business and legal questions associated with your dental practice. Don't forget to subscribe to the dear doc podcast on all major platforms.